All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, January 19th, 2016. We'll start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the Board's convening now in public session. We start off the evening in the executive session where we discussed Strategies with respect to collective bargaining updates by Tom Manager relative to fire police DPW and dispatch. Strategy with respect to litigation with, with respect to NSTAR Eversource. Strategy sessions and preparations for negotiations with non unit personnel relative to the town manager. And to consider the purchase, lease, or value of real property on East Main Street. Uh, board will open the meeting now as we always do with public session and public forum. Residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Anyone like to come to speak at public forum this evening? Okay. Seeing no taking, takers, the board will move on to the consent agenda. Several action items tonight. First is minutes. The board will consider accepting the following public session minutes. June 23rd, July 14th, August 11th, August 31st, September 11th, September 15th, and September 22nd, 2015. Second is parade permits. The board will consider the following parade permits. Proponent live for Evans, starting point EMC Park, ending point the Loop Road. Saturday, September 10th, 2016 is a date. No street closings. Second one is Max Performance, Tim Richmond, starting and ending at Hopkins State Park. It's got two dates, May 15th and September 11th, 2016. No street closings. And the third item is a one-day liquor license. The board will consider approving a one-day liquor license request from the HPTA for a chili cook-off to be held at St. John's on Saturday, January 30th, 2016 from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. They're requesting a malt and wine one-day liquor license. And fourth, uh, board resignation. The board will consider accepting Bob Levinson's resignation from the personnel committee. Would anyone like to break out any of those items? I'd like to break out 2.1, please. 2.1. So the parade permits will break out. I'd like to break out item four. Okay, items two and four. So chair will entertain a motion to approve items one and three. So moved. I moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President, voting. That's unanimous. Parade permits. Mr. Sestari. I was just wondering on the Live for Evan parade permit, noticing that the starting point is EMC Park, the end point is the Loop Road, but there are no street closings. And I'm trying to figure out how that happens. Do we Safely. have anybody who can answer that? Anyone from the police department know the route? <clears throat> Right, exactly. He, I saw him at himself the distribution list. Yeah. <coughs> Lieutenant Porter, good if evening. Pleases the board. Um, in the years past, and we haven't received this year's plan from them. Hasn't changed in the last four or five years. They start at EMC Park. They go down Hayden Road Street to Little Hayden Road Street, Main Street to Pleasant Street, back to Big Hayden Row, and into the Loop Road where they finish. So there has been no street closings, no requests for street closings in the past for this. So it's they just run on the side on the little? Yep, they, they stay to the side. We use marshals and we use um, officers at key locations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the parade permit? Okay, Chair a motion to approve the parade permits. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President, not voting. That's unanimous. Um, Mr. Mosier, item four. I'd just like to specifically thank uh, Bob Levinson for his contributions on the personnel committee and also specifically for the, for the police chief hiring committee and the uh, fire chief hiring committee that I had the privilege of serving with him on. Uh, I think it's uh, a rare opportunity when the town has someone who does executive coaching for a company of the stature, BMC, uh, donate their expertise to the town. And I uh, very much appreciate the efforts that he's made. And uh, wish him well, and hope he volunteers again in some capacity. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Kamala. If I may, um, I also would like uh, to add on behalf of town and employees, our sincere gratitude to Bob for the massive hours that he dedicated to us, uh, providing training, much needed training to town hall employees. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd just like to thank Bob as well. Bob, how, how, long, how long were you on the personnel committee? 10 or 11 years, I'm not sure. Well, 
Thank you very much. Um, you know, I know that uh, um, personnel committee is is you know, probably among those committees where, other than those uh, occasional searches, there's not a lot of spotlight uh, put on the hard work that you're doing. Uh, we appreciate it as a board, um, and uh, thank you very much. Okay. Good. Chair, I entertain a motion to approve the resignation. Accept the resignation. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President Funding. That's unanimous. All right. Item number four, board appointments to the Irvine Tadar properties. It's an action item. The board will consider appointing candidates to the group, three large candidates, and we have um, a number of them listed. So let me find my list here with all these candidates. All right, so Irvine Tadaro. We have, is it, are we confident this is the right list this week? Yes, um, <laughs> for the board's information. In fact, Danielle Genron, she's moving out of town in six months. And given the fact that the project life may exceed six months, she asked that she withdraw her name from consideration. Okay. So by my calculations, we have four candidates? Yeah. Kathleen Teague, Alton Chen, Patrick Sansonetti, Donna McKenna. I should point out, Gail Carey, okay. who he had applied, cannot attend tonight's meeting because of a prior commitment. Okay. And she did express a very strong interest. So she's interested, she just can't do it. So we have five candidates for three positions. Yes. Okay. So let's just start, we'll just start off. Um, is Donna McKenna here? Hi. Would you mind coming on up and introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this? Well, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Donna McKenna. I live at 132 Hayden Row Street. I'm a lifetime, with the, the exception of three years where I was traveling, um, resident of Hopkinton. I'm employed as Vice President of Communications for the Massachusetts Association of Insurance Agents. And I felt like I wanted to give something back, particularly in my neighborhood, because the school is going to be across the street from my home. That's why I volunteered. Okay. Does anyone uh, have any questions for Ms. McKenna? Okay. So you're interested in the, in the property because, again, so it's, it's, you're, are you legally in a butter, considered in a butter? Do we know? I think so. I'm across the street. Okay. Yes. And that's not going to cause any problems, right, because they don't, they don't have decision-making capacity. That is correct. Okay. Great. Have you ever done anything like this before? No. Nope. All right. This is first time for everything. We like first it. time. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank this you. Is Patrick Sansonetti here? Hi, Patrick. I am. Good evening. Hi. Could you introduce yourself and just tell us who you are and what you're, why you're interested in this? Sure. My name is Patrick Sansonetti. I lived in Hopkinton from 1981 to 1990. Okay. Family moved away, moved back into Hopkinton in 2006, lived here since. I lived at 152 Hayden Row, which was also, I owned 154, which was across the street and I believe legally abutting, although I'm not totally sure. Okay. I now live just on 154 Hayden Row Street, uh, which again, I can think is right across the street. Would love to get involved in the development of the property and express my opinion. Great. Thank you very much. Anybody, anybody any questions for, um, for Patrick? Is it, so is this your, your, your first um, time volunteering for? Yes, it is. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much for coming well, forward. Thanks. Alton Chen. Good evening. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Good. So, Same for you, yeah. So I am a uh, resident of Hockington at 3 Nicholas Road in nearby Charles View Estates, or Charles View neighborhood. Uh, I'm active member on the Capital Improvement Committee. Mm -hmm. And over the last two years, um, have certainly been interested relative to the size of this purchase for the town. Uh, would like to contribute to uh, the long-term direction of how the property is utilized, how it uh, is uh, is determined to fit within the town town uses of school and uh, additional properties. Certainly, in capital improvement committee, uh, we've seen multiple proposals come through, and I'm certainly interested in. Uh, helping to guide its future growth versus having 
lots of little pieces and parcels. Right. Okay. And are you legally in a butter? Do we know? I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense. I'm not in a butter. No. You're not. You're not legally in a butter. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Chairman? No, he just filled in. Filled in for me. Great. Okay. Anybody else? No. Thanks very much for <clears throat> the forward. And then we said Gail Carey can't make it tonight. Yep. And so Kathleen Teague, is she here? Okay. No, Kathleen Teague. Okay. So we have three folks who showed up tonight out of five people who are interested in the position, and we have three slots to fill. Does anyone on the board have any um, thoughts, comments? Mr. Uh, Sistar, you want to start? Yeah, I guess, you know, my, <clears throat> my only comment, first of all, I think that this makes it pretty easy, the fact that three people showed up and there are three vacancies. Um, you know, initially when we were trying to figure out uh, what we wanted the composition of this board to look like. I think that we were looking for, um, in the at-large spots, we were looking for some representation from neighborhood people, uh, you know, including abutters, and then some representation from people outside uh, that immediate area. I think initially I was actually thinking that, uh, uh, you know, there might be two people on the board or on this committee possibly three that were from that neighborhood. But I've really had a change of, th uh, change of heart on this. And, uh, you know, these, these three people are all from that area, from that immediate area, uh, as well as there being another member uh, who's already been appointed who's from that area. And I think these are the people who, you know, they have, they have uh, the most to be, uh, to, to consider you know, when they're trying to figure out uh, what to recommend to our board, go in that area. Uh, in the end, I think that we're all kind of thinking that whatever goes there might be something temporary. We want to make sure that uh, we're leaving our options open for the future, but at the same time get some good value out of the property right now. But who knows, it might be something that's longer term and, and stays there longer term as well. So, uh, you know, I just want to, I just want to give my vote of, uh, I guess, confidence in having four people out of a seven-member committee who are from that immediate area and have the most at stake, and then the other three people who are from other parts of the town uh, also also giving more more broad views, I guess. Okay. Mr. Mosier. Uh, I think <clears throat> the folks that showed up um, like to have a, we have a nice <coughs> mix, as Mr. Sestari pointed out. Uh, they certainly have interest. Um, for the other applicants, there is no shortage of volunteer positions with the town right now. So um, I think I'm comfortable with the three that we've seen this evening. Ms. Catino. Well, I, I'm, I'm, pretty, well I, I'm one of the members of the board uh, of that committee already. Um, yeah, and, and, and to um, uh, keep up with uh, uh, Sestari's remarks, uh, remarks is that uh, initially I was I wanted a, a very diverse board. I figured a, a couple from the neighborhood, um, and then people from from other parts of town, just to get it to get a diverse feel. Um, but um, you know, I I just love the fact that that you actually signed up and showed up, and, uh, and that's that's part of it is to actually come out for the meeting. So you came today, and so um, I I think it'll be I think it's fine. Okay. Good. So we have, uh, we have, it seems like, an interest in all three folks. I, I will say I, I worry about committees that are composed overly of abutters, but this is an advisory committee, and so we still have the final say, and so I think that sort of mitigates the risk. Um, um, because, again, this is a very expensive town asset that we need to be thoughtful about, but it, as you said, we're not going to do it all at once, and, and, and we get to have a chance of to look at this anyway. So I'm good with all this. So. Yeah, and with Mr. Chen being on the Capital yeah. Improvements Committee, that's going to give us some, uh, some great insight onto what the, that, that committee is thinking. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. So, Chair Lennington, uh, any motions? And we can do them all at once, I think. <laughs> yeah, we'll do them oh. all at once. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, I move that the board vote to approve uh, Donna McKenna, uh, Patrick Sansonetti, and Alton Chen uh, for the uh, Irvine Todaro <coughs> Properties Advisory Group. As at large candidates. As at large candidates. I'll second it. 
Okay, we have a motion to second any further discussion. We're good. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That's unanimous. Welcome all of you to the committee. Thank you very much for offering yourself, and uh, we look forward to getting this started. So you'll, you'll be hearing more in the immediate future from somebody. So, all right, thanks again for coming in tonight, folks. All right, next item on the agenda is staff appointments. A number of these we have to do tonight. Um, the first one is the town manager contract, but the chair is going to take that off the agenda because we're short a member tonight, and we always like to vote these things with all five members. So that's getting, that's getting put on hold just because we don't have all five of us. Second one would be police department sergeants. The board will consider promoting Aaron O'Neill and Matthew McNeil as new sergeants of the Hopkinton Police Department per Chief Edward Lee's recommendations. Third is the board will consider appointing Matthew Santoro as a department's newest <coughs> police officer. And the fourth is special officer. The board will consider appointing Lieutenant Chuck Wallace as a special officer for a three-year term to expire January 19th, 2019. So why don't we take these one at a time? Chief, you want to come on up? It's a, it's a police night. I'd just like to start talking about the, uh, the sergeant's process. Uh, the original list started about a little over a year and six months where we had nine candidates. All of them participated in an extremely complicated written test that had many policies that needed to be studied as long as uh, books on leadership. Uh, I was pleased that all nine passed. We made a promotion off that list uh, last year, Sergeant Tim Brennan. And now we have the opportunity to have two sergeant openings, one with the retirement of uh, Lieutenant Chuck Wallace creating a position and a new creation of a uh, lieutenant spot. Now, uh, the two sergeants that I have tonight, if you can bring them both up, it would be Sergeant, or soon to be, hopefully, <laughs> with the board's blessing, Aaron O'Neill and Matt McNeil. I'll start off uh, with Aaron. Uh, Aaron did extremely well in the process. Uh, we recently held a, a, a second round of interviews, and I'd like to thank uh, the, the members that assisted me. I was on the board with Maria Casey, the HR director, and our school resource officer, Phil Powers, and uh, they were very impressed with both candidates who rose to the top in the uh, entire process with the testing, oral interview, and of course uh, their backgrounds on the police department. Um, I'll start off with Aaron O'Neill. He is an Army veteran of the rank of Sergeant, Military Corps. He was awarded a graduate MP, uh, MP school, Army Corps uh, Combination Medal, <coughs> Army Achievement Medal, and other medals and awards. He was uh, stationed over a peacekeeping mission in the uh, Bosnia area. Uh, he is a graduate from Westfield State, and he is currently with, with a, uh, a bachelor's in criminal justice, and he is currently enrolled in the master's program at Ulamo, uh, UMass Lowell. Where we uh, expect graduation next year? Hopefully. Okay. He's 17 years on the, uh, <laughs> the department. He has been an FTO. He is the EMT coordinator. Uh, bike officer, firearms instructor, uh, recently took over the position as the uh, police association president, and uh, he's also had the opportunity to run and finish the Boston Marathon. And that's the only way you get a day off from the marathon is you're running. <laughs> <laughs> At what time? Uh, 4.40. Very good. Wow. He has also completed a task in the... Uh, uh, honor of fallen offices where he's done six police unity tours. That's riding his bike uh, from uh, uh, New York all the way to <coughs> Washington, D.C. Oh, we also want me to mention that he's an all-around good guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at this time, I'd like to present you with uh, Officer O'Neill. Good evening, gentlemen. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us. Whatever you think you should be, <laughs> would improve your chances. Well, the, uh, the, the chief did a fine job of uh, giving uh, my little uh, pre-resume. But uh, I've been here for 17 years. Um, I grew up in Westboro, which is a tight-knit uh, community. I bet if you can um, My mother was glad that I got hired by the town next to us. 
because <laughs> I went all over the East Coast looking for a job and I ended up in Hopkinton. Um, working here in Hopkinton has been uh, such a great experience. I was given an opportunity. I work with uh, the finest men and women. Um, those people that know me know my family is my closest thing to them and I consider the Hopkinton Police part of my family. Excellent. Does anyone on the board have any questions for Officer O'Neill? No questions, but no he questions. just sounds like a nice guy. <laughs> Say that at a traffic stop. Yeah, okay. No, I'll tell you, you know, thanks for, thanks for everything you've done for not just Hopkinton, but, uh, uh, but for the country and, uh, you know, and all the causes that, that uh, you, you continue to help support. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's great. It's great that you're finding, uh, or making, I should say, making the time uh, to continue your involvement, and I mean, this is this is you know kind of uh, there is no cookie cutter, but if there was, this is the cookie cutter of uh, the people that we want, uh, you know, in, in our town and and helping serve our town, and and I don't think it's a mistake that that's happened. Uh, I think that uh, it's it's the community that draws people like this, and it's also people like this who help make the community what it is. So, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, it, 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 to me, it's just amazing. How, how does one stand out in, 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 at the Hopkins Police Department when, the, 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 when every officer is coming up with new programs and initiatives and everything else? It's just great to hear it. It's an honor to, to uh, look to appoint somebody that, that's, that's been involved in so much and already so, uh, so many other community programs. It's great. Thank you very much. I know your peers think very highly of you. Um, I know it also makes Chief Lee's life really easy every time there's a promotion. <laughs> so I know you really earned this, and, uh, and congratulations. Thank you. This isn't shaping up to be the toughest interview you've ever had, I suspect. Uh, no. so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you going to be days or nights? I'll be uh, evenings and midnights. Evening and midnights? Okay. And is there anything you would do differently or sort of anything you want to jump on early on if you um, get the selection? My 17 years I've been here, I've been on patrol, so I pretty much have seen and done every incident. We have an expanding brand new department with a lot of great young officers. Um, giving my experience that was passed along and traditions that was passed along, down from me from uh, the senior staff, I want to pass along and keep the tradition and the standard high that is the Hopkins yeah. Police Department. All right. I'd love to hear it. Good. I guess, uh, well, well, thank you very much, and uh, let's... Um We'll, we'll, we'll pick up all the votes at once at the end. Okay. Next up is Officer Matthew McNeil. He's a 16-year veteran of the Hopkins Police Department. He is an EMT, a motorcycle officer. He is part of the SEMLAC team uh, as far as the motorcycle. Firearms licensing and fingerprinting and photographing. He's the cruiser camera operator and uh, manager, which is not a, an easy task. He started the FTO program and is currently uh, training our new officer, Santero, over there, why he's going to take on the duties as a uh, sergeant. He has a master's degree in criminal justice from Anna Maria College. <coughs> and uh, one of the uh, note that he well, humble, humbly uh, left out <laughs> is that he was uh, the MAD Officer of the Year uh, several, uh, uh, well, he received it in Hopkinton several times, but he was also recognized as the MAD Officer of the Year for uh, Middlesex County, which is a huge honor with many different communities. Uh, it should be uh, noted that with that many arrests, it's funny that he has a, uh, a twin brother here t tonight. I imagine that you've received oh, dirty wow. looks from the year. <laughs> 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 Holy cow. <laughs> and uh, I'd also like to mention that his two daughters are here tonight. Riley, age 11, and Emerson, uh, age 9, who uh, hope to be pinning their dad tonight. Excellent. Good evening. Welcome, Officer McNeil. So, anything you've got to say? No, just uh, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity that, uh, that, I, that I get. I, I've... Like the chief said, I've been here for 16 years, and as with Officer O'Neill, um, I was hired shortly after him, and uh, um, we've been essentially worked our careers together, and with the senior staff that's that's in place, and, and like he said, the new officers, it's uh, it's a great time to to uh, to become a sergeant to help grow the department, 
and to be um, a part of the administration to help that help the department grow. Perfect. Ms. Casino, any questions? Uh, yeah, I've, I've I've seen you in action and just, you know coming into uh, Golden Pond and everything else, and uh, I just think you're doing a great job, and I'm glad you stepped up for this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just some more questions. Kind of seen you out on the motorcycle, and I, I know uh, I know the other members of the department think very highly of you. Uh, I know this was a very competitive process, as as all of them are, because the department is so accomplished as a whole. Um, so feel good that you earned your way to the position, and I wish you luck. Thank you very much, sir. And Mr. Sistar. Yeah, you know, I just um, another another great example. You know, just the the quality of the people on our force, uh, continuing your education, but not only being centered on yourself, but also uh, getting involved in the. I think it was the FOT program, which field I'm training. Assuming, yeah, field training. Yeah, so uh, you know, trying to mentor others and, and bring <coughs> people along and maintain that quality of, of our force um, you know I mean you just you, you got to love it uh, you know it's fantastic and it's something something um, for us to be proud of as a community and, and chief the fact that you're uh, continuing the tradition and, and uh, bringing that along it's, uh, it's the police time. academy is 24 was it 24 weeks now and then he thinks he got a job and it's all great but he's got an 11 week field training program to go through <laughs> <laughs> I look back fondly on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And you'll be days? I'm sorry? You're going to be days? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> no, I'll go back to uh, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Oh, you I are. You're nice. shift in 12 years. So oh, looking God. forward to it. Yeah, all right. Okay. And anything different you plan to do? Anything different you plan to do or any, anything we shouldn't be aware of? Uh, no. Right now I'm just going to uh, try to settle into my new role and then uh, go from there. Right on. Okay. Good. Chief, you anything final to say before we uh, make a decision? No, I just uh, strongly recommend that uh, you select these two candidates. I think they'll be a good addition to the department. I think they have great leadership qualities. And uh, the thing that sticks out, I think you've all recognized, is they work with FTOs and their mentoring and developing offices. Yeah. Good. Uh, I think as a global point, just to echo what something folks said, I, I don't think we could be happier with the way that the, this department grows people. And, you know, we've sort of, we've had this terrific ability to move people up, and I just, I think that's what makes the board the happiest, is the fact we've got folks who come on board who stay here and, we're, and, and who are having opportunities come to them that they deserve. And so we're, um, I, I think, think we're particularly excited about that. The, the growth trajectory that we continue somehow to be able to offer in the department is great from our perspective. So. With that, the chair will a motion to promote officers Aaron O'Neill and Matthew McNeil as the newest sergeants of the Hockenden Police Department. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President voting. That's unanimous. Gentlemen, congratulations. Congratulations. Sergeant, congratulations. Yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Hey, Sergeant. Thank you. Sergeant, Sergeant. 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 S
Come over here, girls. You guys are the boss. <laughs> this is your room. So let's go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Seen a lot of love there. What are those smiles? I see them. Oh, yeah, yeah. All righty, very good. There's another one. Everyone get their shots? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. See out there. Oh, I'm working at the radio now. <laughs> oh, you might. You might. These meetings go late. Okay. Next up on the agenda, and no less exciting, uh, is uh, the board will consider appointing Matthew Santoro as department's newest police officer. Chief, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, Math Matthew Santoro. He's 23 years old, and he is from Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Uh, graduated at University of Amherst in 2015, where he received a bachelor's degree in sociology, as well as a, certific a certificate in criminal justice. He'll use the sociology a lot more in his job. <laughs> uh, he entered the uh, Boylston Police Academy as a self-sponsor in August of 2015, and he graduated January of 2000, uh, January 15, 2016. Now, during that process, as he put himself through the academy, he uh, was able to take the Hopkinton police exam, scored very well on the exam, and he, he was a, uh, uh, a great candidate because of our situation with all the retirements. Uh, we're able to pick him up in the midst of the retirements and put him through our FTO program. He did extremely well in the academy, did extremely well in the <coughs> process, and uh, we believe he's going to be an outstanding addition to the Hopkinton Police Department. Matthew? Good evening. Hi. Mr. Santoro, I guess, officially still. So welcome. Yes, sir. Welcome. Come on. Tell us. What can we tell us about yourself? Well, I just wanted to say that um, serving others and helping others has long been a passion of mine. Um, and I thought that policing would be the best way I could accomplish that. Um, and, you know, being here the past few days even, um, I felt so welcomed in this community. You can really tell how special of a place it is. Um, and I want to be a part of keeping that community safe and um, letting the people of Hopkinton know that they are truly cared about by the men and women of this department. Um, and over the past six months, I've learned a lot about policing. Um, and I know I still have a long way to go, but I have full confidence that I'm learning from the, the best men and women there are. Welcome. Seems like at a minimum the Chiefs found a new speechwriter. So. <laughs> <I'm sorry. Yeah. laughs> Mr. Mosher, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so, so is there anything particular about Hopkinton specifically that, that either challenges you or really excites you, something that you've already seen that you want to dive right into? I think it's just how close of a community it really is. Um, you know, I've, I've met people who I've never met before today, and they, they treated me like I've known them forever. And the department truly is a family. You can, you can tell when day one. I mean, I'm on day two. But, uh, on day family one. good? <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, they've treated me with a, a ton of respect and, and like one of their own so far. So, that, so that'll probably change once. Uh, <laughs> it's all a downhill slide. Oh, that's here. great. Glad to hear you're looking forward to it. And yes, uh, really look forward to seeing you out there. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mr. Sestari. Um, you know, first of all, congratulations. And uh, tell us a bit, uh, I guess, between you and the chief about uh, sponsoring yourself for the police academy. Is that something that happens often, or is that out of the ordinary? No, that, um, that does happen often. So about half of my academy class at the beginning of the uh, academy was self-sponsored. And what that entails is um, you cover tuition and, and equipment and stuff like that, um, and you, you have to get a, a, uh, a chief of any town to, uh, to sponsor you through the academy as so. Great. Well, I'm sure that you can, you can see just from tonight's, uh, uh, tonight's meeting and, and, you know, the
these go on and on, it seems. You know, we have a few a year where, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about some of the accomplishments of various officers. Um, there's, there are big shoes to fill here in town, and uh, just the fact that you were chosen means that everybody has confidence in you. So uh, we're looking forward to your growth uh, in the community, and we thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to you know, seeing a, a nice a young guy coming, coming into, the, uh, into the group, uh, somebody that doesn't have a master's a law degree or something. That you're going to have a lot of great people to learn from. Um, you can bring a nice, fresh perspective, and, and um, it's uh, great to have you uh, chosen. Thank you, sir. Okay. So we really like our police department here in town, you can tell. Yes, sir. We've got a great group of professionals. And uh, so you, I really say this earnestly when I say we, we think you should feel, consider yourself exceedingly lucky to be able to join them. I do, sir. Uh, you've got a great crowd. So go forth and make us proud and uh, do what they've always done, and you'll be fine. And you'll, we'll be proud of you someday. We may make you a sergeant. So, yes, sir. Okay? Thanks, sir. Good. Uh, Chief, any final com questions, comments for us? No, I think uh, just from his appearance uh, tonight, kind of, he kind of stands out as an excellent candidate for the police department. As I said, he did very well. And uh, to take any initiative to uh, invest in and uh, self-sponsor yourself is a big deal. It shows your, your commitment. Uh, he didn't have another job. I think uh, he had to live with mom and dad, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's a huge commitment and an investment. All right, with that, the chair will a motion to appoint Matthew Santoro as the newest member of the Hopkinton Police Department. So moved. Second. The motion and the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President Spilling. That's unanimous. Officer Santoro, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you for that nice ovation. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. so can we record five votes for that? <coughs> you voted I voted that walking in. You voted walking in. Disqualified. It's <laughs> okay. That's good. Yeah. If only they were all like that. <laughs> Of course. Take this picture. Yes, he did. Yeah. It's for the kids. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and last but absolutely not least, the board will now consider appointing fresh new face Lieutenant Chuck Wallace as a special officer for a three-year term to expire on January 19th, 2019. Chief, you got anything to add or you're good on this one? I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Quick, where's Officer Santor? Get him in the. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of uniform, so let's uh, We're right. just happy that Chuck's going to uh, stick around with us in a uh, special capacity and help us out in uh, certain areas. It'll be nice to see his face around the marathon so I can run up and ask him uh, questions if anything should arise. But uh, he'll be handling you know, traffic details. Okay. Okay. Chuck, you don't need to come up, but if you've got anything you want to say, you're good. Get out of the house. That's right. <laughs> All right. Channel 10 a motion to appoint Lieutenant Chuck Wallace as a special officer for a three year term to expire January 19th, 2019. So moved. Second. And any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President, voting. That's unanimous. Lieutenant Wallace, welcome back aboard. Sort of. <laughs> All right, thank you all for coming in. It's been great. Item six on the agenda, liquor licenses, 2016 changes and hours of operation policy. It's an action item. The board review the hours of operation policy for restaurants and related establishments and then consider approving nine licensee requests for a change in hours or other aspects of their license. And there's a number of supporting exhibits. So here's the idea tonight. Um, we have a memo from the town manager. Yeah, Brian. Okay. With a number of um, a number of uh, basically a list of items on it. I'm trying to bring it up here as I speak. And um, there's a number of questions for us to consider. And what, the reason this is coming up is because the board said we want to have more of a holistic pot, right? We don't want to we don't want to run the minutia of everybody's business. We want to set relatively broad policies, and then by and large, we want to let businesses operate as they see fit within the constraints of those policies. So we. Um, what we have tonight are a number of items to talk through. If we're going to change the hours of anyone's liquor license, we need to have a public hearing. We're required to do that. So what we'd like to do tonight would be to talk about the, the concepts here that are in this and basically walk through this list, answer some questions. Then we would ask the town manager to go off and draft an actual policy that he'll come back with, and we'll approve that policy as part of a public hearing. Everybody got it? Questions on how we're going to go about this? Mr. Hurt, you have a question? Is the chief going to be here for this discussion? The chief of police? Police. Uh, he's here <clears throat> currently. We can ask him to stick around if you want to talk through things. I don't see him in the room at the moment. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have him here. Um, uh, uh, Lieutenant Bennett, yeah. could, could you ask the chief to come? Could you I'm ask sorry, the chief ben. to come on back? Yes. Sorry. No, it's okay. I was, um, I was having Is the chief slamming him? I, I know. I was, uh, I was like, it's Joe. It's Joe. <laughs> So thank you for jumping in. I think maybe if he was in on it too. Pardon? Okay. So does everybody understand the, the concept here? We, we're not. We're not the chief. Hi, uh, Mr. Harass. If you could come on back, you don't. You, you can just kind of hang out for the moment. Okay. What we're doing is we're going through this the liquor license um, revisions, mm -hmm. and I think there may be questions for you as to your opinion on the judgment of some of these possible changes. Now again, we're not going to vote these changes tonight because that requires a public hearing. The goal is to go through these items. Right, come to some conclusions, have the town manager draft the policy that then gets approved at a public hearing. Okay. Mr. Kamal, you got anything to add before we uh, just dive right in here? Um, no, no, nothing to add at this point other than just to remind the board <laughs> that uh, we did provide the specific regulations from the mass general laws regu regulating the hours of operating uh, for such establishments. Uh, as well as uh, a database of all the existing establishments, uh, their existing hours, as well as what they have requested for uh, service hours in uh, calendar year 16. Uh, in addition, we also provided the staff memo that gives the board uh, different options for, to consider as you go through your discussion. Okay. So what I'm going to work off, everybody, is this memo um, from the town manager to us today, January 5th. And again, it includes a bunch of appendices, including some the list of the current hours and requested changes. Um, currently, as we all know, we, we do this on kind of an ad hoc basis, and the goal is to get away from that and again, let people have the latitude to run their businesses they see fit within constraints. So there's three options basically outlined by the town manager, and I, I, um, he and I talked through this, and I agree with all this. Um, certainly one is um, maintain the status quo, just keep doing what we're doing. Second is, again, just try to do a um, uh, uh, specific modifications. And then the third thing would be, again, divide town into basically a downtown area 
um, which might have one set of rules, and then an outside of downtown area, which would be more broadly. Or, in fact, we could do multiple arrangements if we wanted to divide it between 495 and other places as well. So what the town manager did, because I asked him to come up with some basic concept we could work off of, was to, was to find two areas, the downtown core, which is Main Street, going east to Ashland, also on Main Street and down Hayden Row. And he's got a couple different hours for that. And then also all other areas, which would be everything outside those, which would have different hours, which would generally be slightly later, um, an hour later outside the downtown. So things over on 495 could stay open an hour later. And that's for um, uh, uh, liquor licenses in general, basically. And then for package stores, again, the real rate limiter here is um, is state uh, law, which prescribes certain hours that we have to ha let them be open. And so I think, by and large, Ms. Kamal, if I'm not mistaken, you basically propose that we allow liquor stores to be open whatever the legal hours are. Okay. So really no, no prohibition on that outside of what the state allows. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about those two issues first, and then we'll go through a list of specific questions that the town manager had. Um, and Mr. Sistar, you're jumping back in. I, I think the idea here was to work off the town manager's memo. And, and he, he outlined three, uh, three options, basically stick with what we got, make some specific changes, or, generally, or, or in general, a, a basically identify two zones in town, a downtown district, Main Street, East Main Street, down Hayden Row, that have one set of hours, and then everything else outside those areas would have a separate set of hours, which would generally be somewhat later than, than those hours, like an hour. I think he, I think he proposes to let them be open until midnight. And then for liquor stores, and I don't know if we have to have much discussion on this, I think the, law, the idea is we just generally let liquor stores be open whatever hour state law allows. So does anybody, does, how do we want to start this off? Does anybody have any comments on... We take on, the easy one first then? Yeah, so let's talk about liquor stores. Does anybody have any desire to modify liquor store hours beyond that, what you're provided for in state law? What are, the, what are those hours? So it's 8 to 11 a.m., uh, basically every, every day except for Sunday, which is 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. 8 to 11 p.m.? Yeah. 8 a.m. to 11 p.m.? 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Is state, is state law Monday through Saturday, 11.30 p.m. on a day preceding a holiday. And then on Sundays, uh, it's 10 a.m., so it opens two hours later on Sundays to 11 p.m. However, the Board of Selectmen does have the right to prohibit the sale of alcohol beverages on Sunday by licensees. And then on holidays, the Mass General Law is um, they have to be closed on Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas Day, or the day following um, Christmas Day when Christmas Day is a Sunday. So that's state law. And the only re real thing we could really modify there would be not close liquor stores on Sundays if we chose. So we don't have anybody using that full, I'm sorry, can I go? No, oh, please. We don't have anybody fully utilizing the hours prescribed by state law I, that I'm aware of. No one's opening at 8 a.m. and going to 11 p.m. in town that I know of. Nobody I've never been out to look at I, I, I don't know if anybody requested I think Right, I don't think the that. market supports it, and I don't think anyone's asked for that, right? As far as I know, but I, I, don't, I don't go to liquor stores. And could we morning. say no to somebody if they wanted to stay open until 11? I think the state law, you have to, I think you have to do what the state law says, right? I don't think you're, the only constriction you're allowed to apply to law. So just to be clear, anybody now could apply for that, and we couldn't deny it. They just, and this is part of the issue, right, is they, they may apply for 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., but... You know, that's what they want. But again, we have no basis to deny them if they want to open at 8 a.m. Mr. Kamala, tell me if I'm right, because I'm making, right? I believe that to be the case. You're if a liquor store, right? Is yeah, that? Absolutely correct. Okay. Yeah. The only thing we can do is say that liquor stores can't be open on Sundays. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. So if they want to be open at 10 a.m., right now they apply for 10 a.m., but we can't, you know, that's. Patriots, Red Sox. Mr. Kamala. Yeah. The, the only other instance uh, in which the board could regulate the hours of a public store is when there's a violation and right, imposes right. hours. I'm assuming law-abiding owners, yeah. right. Okay. So is that, did that answer your question? I'm good. Does anybody else have any questions on, we're trying to take the easy one first, liquor stores. Does anybody have any questions about liquor stores? Uh, I don't have any other questions on the liquor stores. Um, it, it surprises me that um, we have to allow uh, that state law as opposed to the state law being the loosest we can be. Uh, but if that's the case, then I guess we don't really, our, our hands are tied there. Um, you know, I, I would be fine with supporting uh, closing them on Sundays um, if, if the board feels that level of support as well. Right now, Mr. Kamala, we, we allow them generally to be open on Sundays, right? 
we don't have anybody closed on Sundays. Yeah, the, I'm looking at the, the database, yes, uh, we have allowed them to open on Sundays. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mosier, any thoughts about liquor stores? No, I think I'd probably just stick with the current policy on liquor stores. Okay. Mr. Kamal, can we review the current policy on liquor stores, which is, which is just basically they have whatever the hours they apply for, as long as they're within that window we approve? Yes. I think based on what I'm hearing from the board, unless the board uh, feels otherwise, we can craft a policy that uh, basically outlines the hours as they are provided for by state law. Have you any comments on that? Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I just don't see putting um, Hopkinton businesses under any more constraints than neighboring towns. Okay. All right, so Ms. Kamal, I think that one, you got the idea from the board, which is we can leave well enough alone on that one at the moment. So the yes. policy will be per state guidelines. So does that mean regardless of the hours that a business applies for, we're going to cross it out and say, 8 o'clock to 11 p.m.? Or? Well, no. so I think as long as they're going to, again, liquor stores are kind of a really easy answer because as long as they uh, want to be within those hours, they can have it. I mean, it's essentially the law, right? So we don't, it, doesn't really, it almost doesn't matter. There's nothing to do about this. But, but that's but a good they, question. But are they applying for specific hours? So I think we're Typically trying to draft a policy about what we will follow going forward when people apply for a license. Right. Our policy will be for liquor stores that we will follow state guidelines and regulations. Right. And if you're within those guidelines and regulations, we're not going to argue with whatever hours you apply for. But when you apply for your license, you get specific hours based on that license application. So as long as it's in th inside that window of 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., I think we would have to approve it if this is the policy we adopt. So Does that make sense? Yes. So question, well so question through the chair, you yes. could have a business apply for hours beyond the state license, correct? No, that's not, that's not allowed. Yeah. It would not be allowed. Yeah, that's not, it's not allowed. The board has no discretion. Right. So there's really nothing for us to do here. The period. truth is, that, that's why I was trying to, that's, the easy one. that's why I thought this would be the easy one, because there's really nothing for us to do except right. close liquor stores on Sunday, which I don't hear a great outcry for. Other, so. other than, other than um, you know, Mr. Catino had uh, you know, kind of the argument a couple of weeks ago regarding just enforcement and if we approve everybody for the broadest amount of hours broadest number of hours uh, <coughs> we can, then it's easier for the police to be able to go by and say yeah well I know everybody's approved to be open till 11 so if I see the lights on at 1015 or 1030 I know that they're approved to be open as opposed to saying yeah, well, I know the state law is 11, but these guys only applied for 10, and I think they were approved for 10, so, you know. But again, I don't think we can constrain their hours. I think this is one where we approve a license with certain hours, but it's extra legal. I don't think we, I don't think we have the right to control their hours. Well, so, so through the chair, I, let me I'm just sorry. hold. Maybe, maybe just Mr. Catino, I mean, Mr. Sistari finished, and I'll come to you, I promise. I, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm confused then. Why are their hours put on, on the That's my point. I'm not sure there's a reason for it. I'm not sure there's a rationale because I don't know if we're allowed to do it. I, I think the hours still need to be on the license for specificity. Really? But again, if, but they don't have to abide by them. If they put 10 in the license and they decide to open at 8, I don't know if there's anything we can do about it. Because the board has no discretion. That's what I'm saying. Those hours. Yeah. So they can put ten, they can put well, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the no, license. I'm not, I'm not feeling like we know the whole story. Yeah. So so but again, we're go, we're trying to craft a policy that when people apply for a license, they'll know what that policy is. So perhaps the policy should be, the board of selectmen would like, will follow state regulations with the intent and hope that we can have uniform hours across the community for all these stores. And then the license comes in and we make the decision, hopefully encouraging them. They want to stay open until 1030. Well, we really want to close everybody out at 10. Can you live with 10? Right. right? We can't decide what each license is going to be in this discussion here. No, no, and we're not no, going to no. vote it tonight anyway because we're going to go back and. Okay. So, Mr. Morris, I cut you off before. What, oh, so, my, so I just, my question was on, on Sundays, right? So we would, have, we would still have discretion over Sundays. And then do we set hours within that Sunday? Well, again, the hours are 10 to 11 unless the board votes to prohibit the sale of alcohol beverages on Sunday. So you can't, again, you can't change the hours, but you can just not let liquor be sold on Sundays. Gotcha. But I, Mr. Yeah, I just, we, we have no more full liquor license package devices available until uh, the next census. 
unless, you know, unless there's that, there, then there's that, that whole process of going to the state, going to the <coughs> town meeting, and all that stuff. So, part although of it, I think part of it's a a, I think there's a proposal to change that law, but so we renew will, every year. It will become a it will become a moot point at some point. All right. So I think what I'm hearing, Ms. Kamal, is you know, steady as she goes on the on the liquor licenses on, on for package stores. It, to be clear, Mr. Sestari, um the memo from Ray says the board does not the, the MGL does not authorize the board to regulate the hours of a package store licensee absent a violation. That's how clear it is. Okay. So I guess I guess I'd like to hear from town council regarding the hours that somebody applies for and show shows up on the license. Okay, they they ask for hours that were that are within MGL, but they're asking for something more restrictive than MGL. We approve it and then they go back and they try to open outside what is on their license. I want to know what happens then. Last town council. We can ask a question, but I think yeah. I know the answer. Yeah, we'll be ready for the public hearing. What we did is invalid. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get to over state. state. So, so, so is, it a, is it a state format where they're asking um, for, for their license, their liquor license request, or is it a town format? that is saying, tell us what the hours are that you want to be open. I'm just, it's, I'm, it's, it's part curiosity and, you know, I mean, I, I, want, to get, I want to get it right. Um, so why don't we get the answer, rather than just bang this back and forth, let's get the answer from, from town council mm -hmm. and then we'll have the answer as part yeah, of the next, that's fine. when we that's actually fine. look to take a, a action on this. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, because, you know, we're, none of us are specialists. All right, so that's where we stay on the package stores. All right, so now the, now the hard one. Uh, all right, so a couple questions. First of all, do people buy into the idea of having a, a multi-tier system? Well, so here's, the, here's what the proposal is. Two-tier system, downtown, again, Main Street, East Main Street, Hayden Row. That's the proposal for the core. And then, all, then the second idea would be everything outside of that. So, and then the second thing would be, again, there's hours, which Mr. Kamala fit within the current hours generally of opening, although they do, they are somewhat earlier than some places currently close, right? Yes. Although that could be dealt with through a grandfathering, I guess, if we chose. But the question is, in general, do we buy into a multi-tier system, and do we, um, and what do people think about the hours? Ms. Kamala is wrong. No, I think you're absolutely correct. The the grandfathering concept could work in the following way, where uh, as part of the policy discussion, the board decides uh, the length of the grandfathering and also then take advantage of the annual renewals uh, to evaluate uh, the establishments that would have been grandfathered. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Um, my links aren't working on here. Could you just tell me what the, what the proposal was? Yeah. Uh you do that. So what it was, yeah, I had to open up. I had to open it to the index myself. Um, Tom Manager came forward with three choices for how to deal with uh, the um, liquor licenses, essentially restaurants. And it's keep it as it is, which is basically we just sort of do each of these randomly. Maybe address, um, maybe make some modifications. Um, to address some specific areas of, of concern, for example, um, late nights near residences or that kind of thing. Or third, just generally, and I think this is where we tried to go before, just have a acknowledge that there's different locations in town can have different hours. The proposal from the town manager was two areas, what he calls a downtown core, and then an outside of that. With the idea of being a downtown core, those restaurants are going to be generally in closer proximity to residences, so they'd be able to open in all cases from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. And then for all other areas, which would, which would be outside that, which is primarily 495, they'd be able to open from 11 a.m. till midnight. Again, we, we can talk about the grandfathering of some later places, because some licensing for grand go, go to 1 a.m., but that was the general concept. Uh, Mr. Mosier, you want? Do you have any thoughts on this as an idea? Um, I think for the for the poor for the poor licenses. Um, I'm sorry for the package stores. I don't really see. We're done with package stores. Yep, we're, okay. we're just you just we're just gotcha. doing this. We're just um, doing the top two. Poor and, and Victor. Yeah. <coughs> um, so the rationale in the downtown was just 
just kind of a noise factor and the population density around those establishments? Yes, and also um, I should share with the board, I did have some preliminary conversations with uh, representatives from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I think we're all in agreement that to some extent the downtown is still considered somewhat of a semi-residential area. <clears throat> I think it's reasonable. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Catino. Well, again, I'm going to say what I did before. <coughs> I don't think that... Um, we should constrain, you know, we're trying to encourage restaurants to come downtown. And, um, you know, there's one going to be built right next door. Um, you know, and then, you know, when, we, when you think of, um, you know, there's the, the restaurant down to 85 that's been there forever. That's, that's in a residential neighborhood, but it's outside of downtown. So we do have aspects of, of residences near um, uh, other establishments too. So you know, I, I just believe that I'll always level the playing field. Um, I don't want to put uh, people, businesses downtown. Any and any. I know it's only somebody would say it's only an hour, and they and they're probably going to close early anyway. However, uh, if we're um, we you know we just allowed several one o'clocks all across the board um, that we should. Uh, you know, make them all 12, make them all one, but everybody plays by the same rules. Okay. Mr. Hart. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the two zones. I'd be interested in hearing from the chief what his thoughts are on that before I weigh in. Do you get the concept, chief? I know we kind of dropped this on your cold. Um, Did you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mr. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I appreciate his feedback and input. I think there are residences, lots of residences in, residents in downtown Hoppington, and there are lots of residents everywhere else, too. I mean, South Street may not have a lot of residents on South Street itself, but there's neighborhoods right off South Street. Um, you know, the intersection at Lumber Street now is obviously getting built up, but there's residents right off there. and. Um, I think we have to be fair and equitable across the community. So I'd probably, you know, keeping it simple and being consistent, you know, with all the residents, I'd probably advocate for a single okay. policy for a, in a single time slot uh, for everybody. Okay. Mr. <laughs> Sistari? Yeah. Um, you know, this is, this is one I can, I can talk myself onto both sides. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I agree. I, I think that on the one hand, you know, being fair to the business owners, uh, you know, giving everybody a fair shake. At the same time, you know, if we talk to the current business owners in the downtown area, uh, if, if they don't feel that this is a hardship for them, then all the future business owners, as they come in, they know, they know what the deck of cards looks like and they know what the rules are before they decide to open up a business here. Uh, and I do understand that, um, that the population density that's immediately uh, in the vicinity of the businesses, there's, there's a greater density downtown versus, uh, versus out on South Street. Um, you know, that said, for, for ease of policing and things of that nature, and, you know, if we, if we choose to just uh, be equitable, equitable across the board, uh, you know, I can see, I can see just having one rule for all. Um, you know, certainly when things start uh, opening up uh, in any commercial zones out uh, around uh, legacy farms and, and, you know, that type of thing, I think that some of them are going to want to stay open a little bit later as well. So then we're going to have another, you know, difficult decision, which I think uh, by this policy uh, that would be an 11 o'clock, right? Yes out there. So, you know, that's something that we would end up more than likely having to revisit, I would think. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I, I will say that I don't, 
um, I believe that downtown has a, such a number of folks that live here. I think we have to be courteous to them. And so I, I don't believe that having late night established. I mean, if this wasn't such a residential area, residentially intensive area, I would feel less concerned about it. In fact, I might even feel like you could keep it open later to have more people come to the downtown. I will say, frankly, I do not want to infringe upon those people and reduce their quality of life. And I don't think that these hours are a lot shorter than, most, than any resident. In fact, these hours are longer, I think, than anybody has nowadays. Maybe the Thai restaurant is open later. But I, I, I think the, the challenge of this is always how do you um, provide services without damaging residents who are nearby. And I guess I'd, on this one, I'd probably lean towards being more considerate of the local residents um, in the downtown area. So if we want to modify the downtown, if we want to modify the downtown district, I'd probably be more in favor of that. But I personally would err in this case on the side of um, having things get quieter for people to live here somewhat earlier. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I look at I look at some other downtowns that uh, they may be more more you know in restaurant intensive. <laughs> Right. You know where you can walk from one restaurant to another, and if they're both, they both have waiting lists, then you can go to a third, fourth, fifth, sixth options. Um, you know we don't we don't have that downtown, uh, so uh, you know I think I think I, I kind of lean toward that point as well. Just the the uh, residential density downtown is is such that I think at least at this time uh, we should we should make sure that we're respecting the peace and quiet. No. So you're advocating for two zones then? I think I am, yeah. Yeah. I mean, now that you mention it, I didn't really think of it in those terms. Probably, I, I just, I don't know. I could be persuaded. Where do we draw the line, though? So through, through the chair. So right now, I mean, what, back to what do we have downtown? We have Pantai, right? And we have Bills. Bills. Bills is closing at 10. Pantai is 11 p.m. Monday through Thursday, midnight, Friday, and Saturday. Right. And we could just, I mean, that seems. And then we have the new one going to be opening. The new one. Yeah, yeah. But that's still 1 a.m., right? No, that's the 110 grill. Yeah, that's. Um, but the market is dictating these guys are closing much earlier in those hours right there. I don't deny that. I'll we walk out of here tonight at 10 o'clock. So, so what if we just did a blanket Monday through Thursday, 11, Friday to Saturday, midnight? In a downtown area or in town just, generally? Just in town generally. I mean, I'd be okay with that. I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's, that makes it fair across the board. It, you know, I think the, the earlier, the 11 p.m. during the week, kind of buffers the downtown a little. It seems to be working well there now. So only just to, just, for, just to kind of knock this one around a little bit, I think the only comment I'd make is, and this is, just a, this is just a question is, do we want to, and I think this is where Mr. Coutinho is going to go, I'm going to go to him because I promised I would, do we want to start to encourage more or allow at least more, res, more restaurants outside, like in these less intensive areas, one, you know, where 110 Grill will be, that all kind of thing to stay open. Now again, 110 Grill backs up on an apartment complex or will, right. so I'd actually be okay with not having them be open so late either because again, coming back to infringing upon people's lives, right? I mean, to Mr. Hurd's point, there's, there's homes all over the place. There are. And that's kind of just it's the way it is. May just not be a super late night town. I, I don't know that I feel a need for anybody to be open at 1 a.m. in any, any we, kind of residential we, area or near residential Didn't we area. do the 110 Grill and say we're okay with you guys doing that? Yes. With entertainment. But the entertainment's done, no, done at 10. Entertainment's done I, let me go to Mr. Coutinho because I promised I wouldn't. I haven't. Um, you know, bylaws are, are, are put in place to either encourage or discourage. And um, by, by us not being restaurateurs or, or um, people that, that, that are in that business and, and trying to say, you know, put restrictions on the hours when the markets can do that themselves, you know. And if we, and especially at, at, um, uh, to the point that was made, well, well, Monday through Thursday this, and then Friday we'll go to this, and Saturday's this, and then Sunday because it's a day of rest, maybe we should only go to here, or something. We're we're now writing these writing the business plans for these for these businesses that we're trying to encourage to come to town. 
and are we sending out a message, okay, come to town, but we're going to restrict you if you're going to be here or there or someplace else, when, to Mr. Hurst's point, we have, we have um, homes just about everywhere. Yes, there's, there's more of a concentration downtown at this point, but then there will be a concentration near, near the Lumber Street stuff. There are there, there are homes right around uh, where where Price Dropper is, and and there are homes up by up by um, the North Pond House and everything else. So that's why again I think that we should make something a, a, across the board, make it make it even for everybody, and then let the market dictate it to some extent. We can always pull back if 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 something starts to go crazy. But you know, as as we leave again, as we leave here. Um, and we have a late meeting a late that goes past nine o'clock. There really is nothing open downtown. There's, you know, we actually have to run to the edge of town to find anything. And maybe we could encourage uh, more businesses downtown. To, to the chief's point, the last time we were talking about the Thai restaurant staying open until ten o'clock, well, we could have more eyes on the street. You know, it's. Not everybody that's walking on the street is a perp. They're, the the people that are, that are on the street. Um, our, our eyes for the police, and they're actually doing the policeman's job, and 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 this, to, you know, to have more activity in the downtown will encourage. But it's it's more there there, as oh. something was mentioned before. So again, so I, I think the issue here may be somewhat philosophical. I view businesses as being in town to support the needs of the residents, not in of themselves, right? I, I only want businesses in town because I want the people in town to have a lifestyle that people in town want. So I I this doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we just let everybody kind of do what's best for them, <laughs> right? I mean, and, and for me, it's less, I mean, or it's not crime, it's noise, it's just a hassle factor, it's cars coming in and out, it's, right, it's headlights, it's all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I want businesses to exist in town to serve the needs of the town. I think we have an undeniable and absolute right to control their businesses because what it is not always clear that what they're objectives are and what the town's objectives are will align. That's why we're here, is to try to make sure that everything is done for the benefit of the residents overall, right? So so I think so I think, you know, that I may I, I come at this maybe a slightly different angle. I I nobody's saying we don't want them here, John, but I think we're but I think again from my view they're here only for one reason, which is to benefit our residents. And so for me it's always a trade off between letting my fundamental let people do what they want concepts, right? To your point, let the market sort itself out. But also the fact, recognition that, again, in a resident-heavy area, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you're, every minute they operate is infringing at some level upon residents' lives. And the question is, where, is that, where does that trade-off no longer work? And that's what, I, that's what I'm concerned about. So I don't think that a... I could be fine with a blanket policy. I'm not sure in our matters either way. I do think, though, we have to fundamentally be very concerned about making sure that we're, we're not impairing our residents' quality of life excessively um, uh, as one primary consideration. Yes, back if I, to Yeah, you. if I made the, the third point, you know, if, if you notice that, that many of the, the properties adjacent to downtown are, are going up at a much higher rate than some of the properties outside of the downtown, because of the of the um, uh, relative uh, ease, yeah, ease of, of of getting these amenities, and so in as much as you might be saying we're protecting the people by closing it, maybe maybe it makes it easier for them to just walk down the street or walk a couple blocks in order to go to a restaurant or get something to eat or get something to drink. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in as much as we may be saying we're protecting we're protecting you from yourself, may not be the well, again, it's not, it's not as, it's not as uh, patriarchal as that. It's basically saying that at some point there's a trade-off between the benefit of being open an, an extra hour till 12, 30 in the morning and the burden on all the people that live nearby that have the cars coming in and out and the people going by and the loud folks exiting and all the other stuff at 12, 30 in the morning, right? And so, so that, and I'm not saying picking 12, 30 is a certain time. I'm just saying that, that even in your example, you have to acknowledge that there's some level of diminishing return, right? Fewer and fewer people as you get later and later in the night are going to need those services. And the, the impact upon people who live nearby is going to escalate over the course of the night until a certain hour. And what I'm trying to, what I personally am concerned about is where do I, where do those curves cross? And where, where are we now, over, in, in, in a holistic sense, damaging the public good more than we're in, enhancing the public good with extra time open? 
and again, there's there's no straight, there is no simple right. answer, and, uh, but that's that's why I view the downtown as different because I believe that again, given the resident intensive nature of the downtown, it is there's more likely to be an earlier time at which those curves cross than there is on South Street or or even to some extent on on that part of Lumber Street during the intersection. <coughs> So, how do we want to handle this? Because we're running way long. Mm -hmm. Do we just do people want to look at? Do we want to explore two solutions? Do people want to go with one solution? Um, I, I think we're all kind of. I'm not sure where we are actually. I'm not sure I, there's a consensus anywhere. <clears throat> I I like John's idea. I like John Mosier's idea. Um, I'm curious what we're thinking we would do with um, the license that we already approved. Um, yeah. As a follow-off, we, we obviously we can grandfather anything we want, and that, would, that was one of the follow-on questions: is to would we want to grandfather things? So, for one year, or? as long as we see fit. Mr. Kamal, you have something to interject? It's just a question, um, Mr. Moja. Looking at my notes, you mentioned the hours from Monday to Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so no, Monday, Monday, Thursday, Friday, Friday Saturday. Third, right? Uh, yeah, I meant uh, Friday, Saturday. What about Sunday? <clears throat> What happens on Sunday? I don't know. I didn't mention that. <laughs> <coughs> I think they would probably divert to the weekday time. Yeah, I think I think it's probably Sunday through Thursday, Friday. So, yeah, and Saturday. Sunday through Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Okay. So this would be a one, no multiple zones, just across town. Right. So you have a weekday Sunday time Thursday, and a weekend yeah. time. Okay. And what How were do those times? So Pad Thai, uh, Pan Thai, which is downtown right now, closes at. Uh, 11. Well, the no, license okay. allows them to be open until. Right, until 11. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Monday to Thursday, 11. Yeah, Friday to Saturday, midnight. Sunday is 10. But we could, we could make Sunday 11 just to be consistent with uh, Monday through Thursday. So Monday through, uh, Sunday through Thursday would be 11. Friday, <coughs> Friday and Saturday would be midnight. I can look at that. And that's 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., basically? Uh, I did not look at the opening hours. I just went by the closing hours for that one. But by, if I may do it, Chair, if by going – now, that's a 30-seat – a 26, 30-seat restaurant. To, to have them guide it when we're trying to encourage a restaurant um, to move in uh, next door that's going to be a, that's going to be larger and then bills that's trying to expand to compete with 110 and and quattro and compete against uh, you know everything else that's coming to the other side of town um, so through the chair we just make it all one all the same time right he's saying one time across town right. so there'd be, no, there'd be no advantage time wise but again we're also competing with outside of town too well but, but okay but at some level we're competing with Connecticut so no. <laughs> well, no. We, well, we don't want to create an atmosphere where we're going to have people going on pub crawls either. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, this is night. a residential right. community. You know, this I, is a Newport, Rhode Island, right. where I love to go, by the way, but this is not Newport, Rhode Island. So right, who but are we these just, people that eat after 11 and drink on Sundays? <laughs> That's what I, they're not eating. <laughs> not that I've ever been there, but they're not eating. <laughs> But but his but a, a a company just came in town and we said that they should they could stay open till one o'clock, and they bit wrote their business plan. Yeah. To, that, that's to the biggest the, the biggest issue I have, uh, in in the execution, not in the theory, is that we've approved these guys for one o'clock. We can say we're going to grandfather them, but if we do that, then I pretty much feel an obligation that anybody else who comes in and says, well, you know. I want one o'clock too, just so I can compete with these guys. I'm going to have a tough time saying no. You were the one who wanted this policy in the first place. You're the one who wanted I, all this. No, <laughs> uh, no. I think that I think that. Well, they can stay open to one. They can have a license till one o'clock. All the power to them, but no one's going to be there. Right, exactly. But uh, you know, to, we should. Uh, I don't know. You know, even even you know. I just, I just feel as though they, the people write their business plans up, and then to take uh, tend to take two hours away from them. Um, can, well, their business it wasn't plan. A was it wasn't well, one o'clock on the weeknights. That's not their business true. plan was right. written up before they came to us. Yeah, that's uh, that's not us for the permit. But. Okay. Can it, can we? Yeah. All right. So you don't you don't go with eleven p.m. on weeknights and Friday Saturday Sunday. midnight. Do you have a, you do 
But Mr. Mosher does. You, I'd go, you I'd go do. for midnight across the board all the time because I think that's I'm only not, an hour. I'm not, not going to do that. Okay. What are you, where are you? Are you good with 11 p.m. Monday through Thursday? Sunday through Thursday? Sunday through Thursday, I'm good with 11 p.m. close. Friday, Saturday, I'm good with 12 o'clock close. If we've got one where we went to 1 o'clock, then we've got to sort through that. But in general, long-term policy, I think, you know, I think 12 o'clock is... Most people in Hopkinton are asleep for three hours by then, so. But there's more than, there's okay, more than well, one. Okay, you're, but you're in a, you're in a, I, I, I agree. I can go with, I can go with the Sunday through Thursday to 11, and then Friday, Saturday to 12. Um, you know, I don't know if we put in, you know, write in little exceptions for holiday weekends or, you know, something like that. So if it's Memorial Day weekend, you can stay open late on Sunday night or, yeah. You know, well, like that's a refinement. But that's so details, okay. yeah. So again, I'm not going to. We're not going to vote this tonight because we can't. But I mean, I think, and I, with full acknowledgement of the fact you disagree vehemently, and I, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, but I just want to try to move this along. I think the consensus, Mr. Kamalo, is you'd have the board comfortable with Sunday through Thursday, 11 p.m., Friday, Saturday for midnight. The 1 a.m. license is all set for now anyway, right? So it's already been approved for this year, and I think we'd revisit that. Can we go ahead and reach out to Mr. Walker and see what his thoughts are on that? We know him. Can you I know. ask one more question to the chair, to Mr. Kamala? Please. How many, there's more than one that's at 1 o'clock, though. There we're is. Say, we're making it sound like there's one. Coase is, is 1 a.m., Dynasty is 1 a.m., and Cornell's is 1 a.m. And there's one more. What's the one more? 110 Grill. Oh, well, we were just talking so there, about So yeah. over on 495, it's basically 1 a.m. Yeah. What's Cornell's? 1 a.m. 1 a.m. But again, the board could always say, I mean, here's a point. Those are outside the downtown area. I mean, I'm, I'm not going for anything at 1 a.m. inside in no, downtown, I ever. That, so, so then you're advocating for two zones. Well, in essence, or I'm just saying maybe at 495, you just sort of, I mean, again, there's nothing to say we can't do these exclusions over time. And if we say 495 is, to your point, if we say 495, everyone's got 1 a.m. to do something, either everyone's got to close at midnight, so pull them all back an hour, or as a general rule, every, we'll, we'll let everyone else who comes in there just have 1 a.m., that's fine. I'm just never going for 1 a.m. in the downtown district, so, period. Okay. I'll, I'll, okay. So through the chair, maybe Mr. Kamala could find out if these establishments are actually serving between midnight and 1 a.m. Okay. Yeah, for we now, should call why, those folks. For now, why don't we draft midnight, but it, acknowledging that those people have valid liquor licenses until 1 a.m., and we'll figure, that, we'll figure this out in the second pass. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Okay. Good. Okay, and any other highlights we need to address, Mr. Kamalo? So we talked a little about grandfathering. We talked about um, changing hours. We already talked about those two things. Um, may the hours be adjusted by licensing authority if it shall be determined that warrant circumstances warrant further alteration. I think that's for sure. The board's always going to want to keep its prerogatives, right? Mm -hmm. um, may the licensing require that no alcoholic beverages be sold 15 minutes b before the hour stated in the license in which service of alcoholic beverages must cease. Do we want last call 15 minutes early? Yeah. Yep. Any, any, any good bartender does that. So, so 15 minutes early, last call, Mr. Kamalo. Um, do we always want to have a manager or assistant manager on duty and on the premises? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. So consensus is yes. May the licensing authority require the licensees serve alcoholic beverages only to customers who intend to dine on the licensed premises and that menus reflect the requirement that wine and malt beverages and all alcoholic beverages may be ordered in conjunction with the consumption of a meal ordered from the menu on the licensed premises and that manager take reasonable measures to ensure the patrons who are, where, do we live in Utah? I, I, I don't know that I sense that there's no, any no, consent. I, I, I sense there'd be no interest in that, Mr. Is it, am I this licensed on the, properly? This on the meal thing? You have to get a meal? This is the Utah. Oh, well, it'd be good for downtown businesses, right? It'd be good for all the businesses. I think you that's, get a drink, I think that's a rule. Meal. Utah rule. Well, it is. That's a rule in Utah. You have to get food. So, uh, may the licensing Start authority issuing unicards too. May the licensing authority prohibit the manager, assistant manager, or employee of the licensee from consuming any alcoholic beverages or illegal drugs while on duty, except tasting wine to be served to patients. That doesn't sound like a very hard one to figure out. Anybody want to let managers take drugs or drink when they're on duty? No. Okay, seeing no consensus for that, Mr. Kamala will stick with the firm no on that one. May the licensing authority to require the manager, assistant manager, and bartender to successfully complete an alcohol beverage server training program satisfactory to the time prior to their appointment. Yep. Yes. And that all of the employees who serve alcoholic beverages who use house training similar to that completed by the manager, assistant manager, and bartender. You have the most experience as a bartender. Is that the rule anyway? Yeah, in order to get insurance, you have to have Okay, so let's, let's, make that, let's put that in the bylaws, but so. acknowledging that's kind of the way it is anyway. 
not the bylaws, in the, in the regulations. The regulations. Okay. Yeah. So can, with that, can we go off, draft a new policy, and then we'll post a public hearing and we'll finalize it? And post that Actually, one, we'll probably take one more pass through. Why don't we see it again, take one more pass Very through good. to solve these thorny 1 a.m. issues and stuff like that with a little bit of data, and then we'll... Um, with some outreach to those current 1 a.m. Following holders. outreach to the 1 a.m.ers. Including Let's see if we take the 1 a.m. first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rather than do that in a public hearing, I'd rather have some cons consensus on 1 a.m. before we get going. I don't want everyone to get too excited. Yeah, we, can, we can arrange it and a uh, meeting with all the okay. affected parties. My goal is that this is sort of a non-event for people when it comes forward, right? We're not, I don't want to get, get excited. Okay. Uh, do you have enough for Mr. Kamal to go forward on that? Um, I believe so. Okay, good. Any, any, anyone on the board have any other questions, direction, thoughts that we need to pass along? Okay, hearing none. Let's move on to item seven on the agenda, annual town meeting calendar. It's a discussion item. The board will review the annual town meeting calendar. Mr. Kamal, over to you. Yes, um, we shared with you this evening the complete calendar, and I would like to draw your attention to the following key dates. Uh, notice, too, that in the past, the board has asked that we provide this calendar um, together with the regularly scheduled uh, meetings for the board. Uh, those are shown in red in your handout. Um, key dates, let's start off with uh, February 2nd, 2016, uh, where the selectmen opened the annual town meeting warrant. Uh, and also moving on, uh, February 23rd, uh, town manager submits the comprehensive draft budget for review by the selectmen. And then March 1st, um, we are tentatively scheduling the working session between the board and department heads to go through the budget. Uh, March 3rd, the warrant closes. Again, the warrant opened um, on February 2nd, and it closes, as I just said, March 3rd. That gives people approximately a month uh, to work on their warrant articles. I also pointed out uh, March 11, 2016, thanks to Brenda, uh, she pointed out that this is the last day for Board of Selectmen to accept resignations of elected officials in order for the position to be placed on the annual term election ballot. March 15th, the Board of Selectmen adopt a budget and submit it to the Appropriations Committee. Is that the date of a normal meeting, Mr. Kamal? Yes. Okay. Uh, though we, we may, the board may consider the board may consider scheduling that all boards meeting prior to that date, so that at least March 15th is the final chance for the board to finalize its recommendation. Right, because we're not we're not submitting it after that, so we we need to make sure that that budget's done, whatever it takes that night. Can we back up a second, Mr. Chair? If we're if our last day to accept board of selectmen to accept resignations of elected officials for positions to be placed on annual town election. Is March 11th. Really, the last meeting that we have scheduled is March 1st for us to vote to accept those resignations, correct? So it would really have to be March 1st, <clears throat> technically, or in effect, right? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh... Well, no, if somebody resigns, we'll just have to, have to hold an emergency meeting. They sign, if they resign the 11th, we're just going to have to... Well, if we don't have an emergency meeting, then there'll be a special election I, I, no, I agree. I, general I, election. Right. The desired, I agree with you, the desired last date is the first, but the legal date is the 11th, so we'll just have to. Right. If have so to. if someone wants to resign in an elected <clears throat> position in Hopkinton, they want to try and do that before March 1st so we can accept it. Correct. On March 1st. Correct. Got it. Okay. April 5th, 2016, the Board of Selectmen begins to take positions on articles. <coughs> And at that point, we're hoping to have uh, the draft motions uh, available for the board. April 11th is the final date for submitting any ballot questions to the town clerk's office. Uh, we have also tentatively marked April 12th to the 21st as the window within which the board can schedule uh, an emergency meeting to sign the final town town meet, annual town meeting warrant. No, that's going to run into school vacation weeks. So we got to be careful there. Okay. I think that's. I think the 16th is Patriots Day, right? Marathon Day. So we just got to be careful. We may lose people that week. Okay. April 18th. 18th is Patriots Day. Okay. 
And then um, April 22nd, very important day for the town clerk's office. Combined election and town warrant uh, hosted on this day, uh, eight days before annual town meeting. And then uh, May 2nd, annual town meeting begins. Questions? Any questions, starting with this to her? Um, no, I think I'm good for now. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Mr. Sestari. I guess my biggest concern here is that we're not getting a draft budget until February 23rd. So what I anticipate is that we'll get that budget when we're at the meeting. We won't really have a big opportunity to review it in detail to come into the meeting with questions. Then we meet once on March 1st to ask questions, possibly make some recommendations um, you know, for, for goals to try to reach. And then the next meeting we have to accept it and pass it on to appropriations. I, I seem to recall that, you know, I'm just going to say five or six years ago anyway, we used to have more iterations of the process and see more versions of the budget uh, as we were working up toward the, the final that we accepted. And it seems like it's been in the past two to three years that we've started pinching that down and not seeing as many versions and not, I guess, you know, getting to, getting to help mold it and, and you know, fine tune it as we get to that date. And so that's, that's I guess, my biggest concern here. Through the chair, I agree, I agree with Mr. Sestari. I see the school committee is submitting their budget by February 1st. It'd be nice to start to get a sense of the whole thing a little more time to, to work through it uh, than what's in the schedule right now. See, the problem with that is February vac school vacation week, which is what pushes that meeting out to the 23rd. Are so there the only way to do it, I'm sorry, not to, just to finish the thought. Yeah. I don't know that we could do it before then, so the truth is what we'd end up having to do if we, if we really want to do this would be push add another meeting. I think we, the only way to do this would be to add another meeting in either at the end of February or in early March. Because Which, I don't know if we can get done. And the early, the early March one isn't a bad idea. You know, we've got one on March 1st. If we have another one on March 8th, that's closer, than the Mar closer to the March 11th deadline for people to make resignations. Not that that's happened in the past. Um, but it at least starts to coincide with that and gives us one more look. Just a thought. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, you, since, since we take the, the heat for, for the uh, taxes and the budget and everything else, I'd, I'd like some more time to talk about it rather than um, having to uh, argue at the last second. So why don't we pencil in this Camelo meeting on the 8th? And, you know, we'll, kind of, we'll see how it goes. But, but that would give us the 23rd, the 1st, the 8th, and then the 15th we'd finalize it. So basically every week, which is probably about right. And free cash is already done for, for this. Set, finished. So we'll have a better, <laughs> little better sense of what's going on going in. Why is that an issue? <laughs> no. Does that make sense to you, Ms. Kamala? Unless you yes. think there's a way you can do it earlier, but I don't think you can. I mean, I honestly... We only, you, you have to get all in the ninth, and then, and then, uh, the truth is, we're going to end up having to meet again in March, probably anyway. We might as well just plan on it. <laughs> I, I mean, on the one hand, I'd love to before we even go on vacation, uh, you know, the February break, I'd, I'd love to see a straw man. But on the other hand, I also know that I always start to panic when I see that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, this is an interesting topic because. Um, <laughs> Big Yorida in the room, I think, is much third. I'm sorry? The warrant. The big issue that we face in terms of finalizing the budget is that um, the warrant well, is still open until much later. But that's not the operating budget, though. Those all sit outside, right? So there's, there's nothing that's going to affect the operating. Well, okay, there, it could be. It's plausible, but un unlikely that's, that stuff is going to hit the operating budget. Not a big issue. Yeah. But overall, remember, it, 
the, the process uh, formulating the budget really requires our office to have all the components of the budget. Revisions as we get closer. Yeah. But that'll give us one more chance to get one more pass through a, a revision. And by then, to your point, Ms. Kamal, we'll have a really good sense of what the whole warrant's going to look like and all the expenses attached to it. Yeah. Not, again, not that I think that would affect the operating budget. Yeah. Mr. Herr. Not so much calendar Thank specific, you, but budget related. Uh, through the chair, have you had an opportunity to get with Dr. McLeod and just sort of sit down for half an hour and go through sort of where you are and where she is and where the t where we're headed collectively? Not at this point. Is that is there plans to do that? Yes. Outside this schedule here. Yes. Yeah. They did their budget meeting last week, uh, about two weeks ago. Yeah. So we've been to well, a couple week. of those. Several I went of those the one meetings, you guys missed. Yeah, I went the one you guys missed. And um, I like what they're doing this year. I, there's, they're, I think, bottom-up doing a good job, but we still need to sit and understand it in detail. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on the calendar? Ms. Kamal, you, you, any comments from you on the calendar, thoughts? Or, are you good uh, with the March 8th concept? Yeah, I'm good with the March 8th concept, and also... I mean, budget season is budget season. If, if there are issues that come up before the, the 23rd that I believe yeah. or feel that uh, the right. board's input is needed, I'll ask the board to we'll meet before March, you know, February 23rd. Okay. Even if all of us can't do it, uh, some of us will probably be around. But right. So we'll, we'll have something at least. Last question, if I could. So, Please. So we appointed Brenda to be the town clerk. Uh, between now and election day, she's acting. Yeah, acting town clerk, correct? There's no that doesn't impact anything no, in here because that's acting. just an open she position. Yeah, that would then be filled at the annual town election. Jerry's term was up anyway, and so it was it's going to be it was up for election anyway. Yes. Okay. Right. She and by the way, she's not the acting town clerk. She's the town clerk. The town clerk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Questions? All right, we're good on that. Uh, liaison reports, Mr. Catino. Yeah, I went to uh, uh, the Chief's retirement party on, on Friday. It was a well-attended affair, even though it <coughs> took place right in the middle of uh, the Patriots game. I mean, the um, Portuguese club was packed. Um, the Chief got uh, a lot of recognition, a lot of uh, retirement gifts. Um, a, a good time was had by all. It was a, it was a really great event. Well attended. Mr. Sistari. We had our first meeting for the Charter Review Committee last week. <coughs> and uh, it was uh, primarily uh, uh, an organizational meeting. Uh, but we did elect a chair, a vice chair, and we're going to work on uh, electing a, um, uh, what's the right term? Not a secretary, but. Yeah. Clerk. Uh, yeah. The clerk. Uh, the clerk, thank yeah. you, at the, at the next meeting. Uh, but uh, Pam Waxlax is our chair. And um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a good thing. And we are planning on taking this thing on. You know, we, we started looking at options for calendar. And, you know, one of the options is trying to get this done so that we can get things approved at town meeting, annual town meeting. Um, that was incredibly aggressive. Uh, so then we started talking about having a special town meeting within annual town meeting, because basically that gives us a little bit more time uh, to, to actually come up with the articles. Uh, but that's still um, incredibly aggressive. So what we're probably looking at is uh, requesting a special town meeting at some point, uh, either in the fall or next winter. Um, in the end, what, whenever it happens, uh, at the next annual town election, uh, there needs to be, you know, some ballots uh, pertaining to the changes anyway. So even if we did it at the annual town meeting this year, it would be another year before people actually vote on the changes. And so there might be a little bit too much of a disconnect uh, in that regard. Um, but uh, anyway, you know, the, the, the basics of 
understanding what we need to accomplish are there. We discuss those. Uh, we're planning on having, uh, you know, several, uh, uh, I guess, public, uh, not public meetings because all the meetings are public, but uh, public sessions, information sessions, really gathering input from people uh, along the way, and uh, everybody's excited about it. So, if I may add, Mr. Kumar, I, I thought the first meeting was was um, very interesting. Uh, the committee members. Um, showed uh, deep interest in the topics. Uh, the quality of discussion was very, um, uh, very good. Uh, uh, and I think the, the officers that we elected, I think, will, will carry this process forward successfully. I, I, yeah, I should note, uh, I, I mentioned the chair. The vice chair is uh, Michelle Murdoch. And, um, yeah, of course, you know, we started discussing the schedule for meetings. and. You've got a school committee member who can't make it on Thursdays. You've got a selectman who can't make it on Tuesdays. You have appropriations that can't make it on Mondays and Wednesdays. <laughs> so, it's so, it's a, morning. so it's a good thing that uh, we're not trying for annual town meeting and we're going to stretch it out a bit. So. Mr. Harper. Uh, before I get into one quick update, if I could state the obvious, you know, we have lots of different liaison assignments and uh, we have lots of other things that we do uh, specific to uh, our activities here in Hopkinton. So I would just sort of put the message out again to those committees where I am assigned. If you're interested in me attending, please let me know. I don't seek out additional meetings in my life uh, in town because I have a full slate as it is. But if somebody needs me to attend or they're concerned about something going on in town, if they reach out to me, I will be happy to get back to them. I think there's a perception sometimes that we just are going to go to everything. And I don't think that uh, is a, a fair representation of what we can and should do as liaisons to these various committees. Uh, so that said, I'm happy to go to anything, but let me know. Um, the Pratt Farm Team Committee uh, is meeting again next week. And just as an FYI at this point, and I'm not convinced it's necessarily within our purview, but there are some concerns about the beaver dams in the area and floodwaters, et cetera, encroaching on uh, a couple of neighborhoods, or one neighborhood in particular, Huckleberry Road. So while, again, it may not be our purview, we did put them on the agenda to come in and share their concerns. Uh, I think that's probably going to come to the Board of Health, the Board of Selectmen, and others in town to really address. Uh, but. Um, uh, I'll keep you posted on that. We have our next meeting on next uh, Thursday, I believe it is. And I uh, did not get a chance to go to the school committee budget presentation after they did the individual budgets, but I assume you're going to help bring us up to speed on that. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Moyer. I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Okay. You did go to the fire chief's retirement on Saturday. I did. Yes, so, very had two people there. Two attendees there. Yep, excellent. Very enjoyable, wonderful event, absolutely packed. Uh, Mr. Catino had some kind words to say to the chief. Um, I was particularly struck by one gentleman who came up from Pennsylvania, and he has overseen uh, at one point up to 3,000 firefighters at a, at a time, and he does advisements to different departments, including our government. Um, on various aspects of safety around public events. He spoke extremely highly of the training and preparedness of our department and of uh, both Chief Clark and uh, Interim Chief Slayman, and uh, particularly of the organization and preparation with other agencies for the marathon. So that was, that was nice to see some, not, not only the incredible support from members of the department there for Chief Clark, and many people in town, but also to have somebody compelled to come all the way from out of state uh, to see uh, Chief Clark off in retirement. And then uh, the Patriots won too, so it was a great evening. Was all there the way a big around. TV going? There was, but it was in the back, so people pay, paid attention, uh, yeah. Chief. There was, there was a, a video that um, captured the Chief's career, and um, if from the looks of it, all he did was fight fires and have kids and ride motorcycles. Uh, <laughs> so it looked like a, looked like a pretty good career. Um, but, but it was particularly moving. 
and um, it really showed the care and attention that the department had for their uh, for their chief in putting that together. So it was really a, a wonderful event. Okay. Uh, so from a liaison perspective, I did go to the school committee budget hearing ten days ago now, right? You you both go to all of them. That was the one you were conflicted for, so I went. Uh, school committee's superintendent budget is up. Roughly 4.5 percent year over year. It's about 1.7 million dollars in total. Um, when I said it, it seemed like they were closing in on the number. Still, some things to be done. Obviously, the vast majority of it, no surprise, is contractual increases. Um, uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion around fees and how they want to have that from a policy perspective in terms of who pays them and and for what. And so I think there was a lot of discussion on that, but I didn't, there was no decisions made when I was there. So it's a, well, it's a reasonably large number, but it's sort of in line with what they historically do. They always come in somewhere in that vicinity, to my recollection. So, um, so I'm sure you all will be able to go to the next one and, and we'll get more of an update. But like I said, the, the number as of, as of then was $1.7 million. Um, just in terms of a, how we're going to change this agenda going forward, I think we've heard from some folks in the community, and I think we've been sort of frustrated ourselves with um, uh, maybe some of the perceptions out there about our um, uh, activity level in some of these events. So what I've asked Mr. Kamala to do, and we'll pick this up at the next meeting going forward, is we're going to actually change this agenda item to be liaison reports and community events or something. Remember, when I, I don't know, when I first got here, when we first started, we, we used to get invitations to things and we'd sort of find out about them. And I think that sort of has fallen off. And I don't know if just we don't get invited to things anymore or, or what's happening. But what we're going to do as part of this is start tracking invitations that come into the town manager's office for selectmen to go to events specifically. And then we will, at least all of us will be aware of them. And I think to the extent we can, we'll try to allocate those out um, so that folks can go to things that people deem important enough to invite one of us to come to. So um, I think there's been a little bit of a, of a mismatch between our, our perception of how many things we're, we're asked to go to and how many things we go to, and I'm trying to, to do something to address that. So at least we'll be able to be aware now of what's out do, there. And do we get to we're... report on our family time, too? Well, again, I'm not trying to turn this into that how conversation. Much, how little well, of that we have? Again, you know, it, you're right. we asked for the gig. We should, we should do the gig. And so um, um, and we do. it's something we should know. We, yeah, but I, I agree with this <laughs> approach. Right. But I understand what Mr. Cesari is saying, and when things are publicly stated that are factually incorrect, you know, I don't think well, I don't have a problem saying something about that either. And I think what we're talking about here, we're dancing around the issue a little bit, is you know the 300th in particular. We all went to several of those events. I saw you guys at several of those events, and a couple of them I wasn't at. And I know you were at. So I just think that you know the community right now is mad as for other stuff, but that doesn't mean we're not doing our job. I'm not trying to suggest we're not doing we our job. We can't be bashful about letting people know that. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest we don't do our job. I'm not trying to suggest we don't spend lots of hours. I think we all do. And I'm not trying to say I'm overly reacting to maybe you know, a small but loud group of voices. All I'm trying to say is we, we, you know, there are significant community events that, if, that I think there's a disconnect sometimes because some people expect us to be there, yet the, we're not actually asked to go to it, right? And so we have to, we have to sort of be able to know what... what what people think is important enough for us to attend and then attend. So, I mean, a lot of these things we go to on our own just because we are connected. But I, but I would like to, I, I think it would be useful for us to know what, what people want us at. So sure. at least we have, a we, have, we, have a, we have a comprehension of what's, what, what the communities, you know, or, or what the communities ask is, right? And, and whether or not we can go. I mean, like, you know, we're not going to make everything every time. Some things we'll probably never make, but at least we'll know. We shouldn't do as too much as a discussion yeah, yeah, on it, but, but I just... Yeah, to, to your point, uh, you know, I, I go to a lot of things, and, and several times during the week people said, well, there was a bean supper over the summer that nobody came to. I didn't know about a bean supper. Right. You know, and that's the thing. So you're right. We have to be... Unless we're invited... They... If you want us to come in an official capacity, you have to invite us, and then we'll... Exactly. And then, obviously, it depends on whether people can make it, but we'll try. I mean, we all have families. We all work, right? We're all super busy. But it is there, part there, of the there was, What's funny is, funny, 
there was a time when people were complaining in town that the selectmen were too involved in things, right. sticking their nose into everything, and they didn't belong there, they didn't get elected to do that, and they went on and on about us being too involved. And now they're yelling, so we're not involved enough, so we've gone full you know, we'll figure out a balance Sorry when we try to make a decision. When I first came to this board, I was told, don't go to all these things because you're just going to annoy people. I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm just looking for a balance, and I, feel, I and I feel somewhat out of balance, and so I'm just trying to find a way that I can help us try to get to a balance. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't do our job. I'm not saying anything negative. I'm just, I'm just trying to be thoughtful about this, right, in a way I can. That's all. It's a great so idea. We'll, we'll, we'll play it. We'll see how it goes. We'll see. I'll go to a bean supper. Okay. All right. Uh, don't agree with me. And that's it on Liaison Reports. Mr. Kamalo, Tom Manager. A, if you have anything to add to this conversation, and then B, you can go segue right into the Tom Manager's report. I mean, for the record, Steve Cotino, you did attend uh, Maureen Dunell's retirement party. I, yeah, that one too. Yeah, that's too. Yeah, and, and Mr. Peleco and Todd, you also re attended the lunch on that town hall staff put together for all the retirement staff. Um, okay, I'm not looking for check. I'm so, not looking for so, credit. I'm not looking for check boxes here. I'm just Mr. trying to Chairman, say. Mr. Chairman, I will. I will point out that events with food will gather higher attendance. <laughs> <laughs> not beans. I'm sorry. Not beans. <laughs> not beans. So should we ask for menu not submissions beans. as yes. part of the? Do you like beans? That's, that's that's request. A global, <laughs> Mr. Kamal can go to the bean events. That's right. <laughs> just like restaurant applications always go better when samples are brought, and that's good menus will encourage we'll better. The chili cook-off. The chili right. cook-off is really good. That HPTA thing. I recommend that. That was a great. Tom Andrews report, Mr. Kamal. Yeah. <laughs> Capital projects. I, I had included this item in case there were any additions to the list that was provided to the board before. At okay. this point, there are no additions. But as we know, when the warrant opens, that list is going to increase. Got it. Um, operating budget updates. So far, our discussions are emphasizing that uh, it's important that all departments adhere to the budget policy statement that the selectmen put forth. Uh, our process is in full gear now. It's, it's, uh, it's that time of the year where all we discuss are budgets. Um, third item, DPW Police Dispatch Union Contract Approvals. Okay. Yeah. So you're asking the board to sign off on the final contracts that have been negotiated, right? Yes. And, and these I've, are, go ahead, Ms. Kamala, please. And I've provided a list of the contracts to, to right. the board. For okay. And these are ones that we have discussed in executive session up until now. Yes. Right? And so, so what we do now is just a final vote to approve. In open okay. session. Okay. And I already explained to everybody we're not doing Tom Andrews' contract because we didn't have five people and we wanted to do five people. So we're, we, didn't, we were missing a selectman earlier. So we're going to do it. We're going to do it in the next executive session then finalize. Okay. I just want to explain that one. Okay, to that, Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, I move to approve the contract between the Town of Hopkinton and the Hopkinton Police Association for a three-year period effective July 1st, 2014, to June 30th, 2017. I also move that we approve the agreement between the Town of Hopkinton and Local 272 of the Laborers International. Can we, just one second. Do we need to do these all separately? Yes, separately. Why don't we do them one at a oh, time? Okay. Yeah. So we have a motion on the table to approve the contract with the police department. Um, second. And a second. Do we have any further discussion? Could I just hear the motion again? I move to approve the contract between the Town of Hopkinton and the Hopkinton Police Association for a three-year period effective July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2017. The Hopkinton Police Association? That's, yes. that's the union. That's the union. For dispatch. No, it's a police contract. Oh, it's for, it's for police. This is the there's police. there's seven, four separate, separate motions. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's I'm four sorry. separate motions. This is the okay. and so these are just we're just yeah right right. This is police. The police union. Got it. You good? We have a motion. We have a second. Are you? Do you? I understand. So it's basically a year and a half contract. It's. I think arithmetically. Yeah. yeah that's okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. Okay. Okay. So it's staying with the, I guess, uh, it's staying with the uh, police theme. I move to approve the agreement between the Town of Hopkinton and the Hopkinton Police Dispatchers Association, Mass Cop Local 254A, for a one year period <coughs> effective July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2015. You sure that? What we. Those dates are wrong. That's correct. 
We had a one-year contract first, and then there's a second one-year contract. Yeah, right. There we go. Okay. I, I further move to approve the memorandum of understanding between the Town of Hopkinton and the Hopkinton Police Dispatchers Association, Mass Cop Local 254A, for a one-year period effective July 1st, 2015 to June 30th, 2016. Got it. So we have a motion. Second. And a second. Further discussion? Mr. Hart. So we went to a central dispatch, and we're still doing a union agreement with the Hopkinton Police Dispatch. Is that appropriate? Ms. Kamala. Yes, that's appropriate. That's the recognized name of the union. But it's still joint dispatch. Joint communications center. So, th so through the chair, just, just for clarity, right, mm -hmm. this consolidated dispatch receives calls for both fire and police, but the dispatchers are all part of the dispatch union. So it's not like there's fire dispatchers and right. police dispatchers over right. there. And that's what this union is representing, that group. Right. But it's called the police dispatch. Correct. I just want to clarify that's That's a good question. Good. Any further questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, oh, President not voting. That's unanimous. All right, and number four, I move to approve the agreement between the town of Hopkinton and local 272 of the Laborers International Union of North America for a three-year period effective July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2017. Can we have a motion? Second. And a second. Further discussion? Mr. Hart. So in this particular motion, as well as in the previous, uh, just for perhaps stating the obvious, we're backdating some of these contracts. So by backdating some of these contracts, we have monies flowing backwards, if you will, to the employees, sort of retroactive. Is that a correct assumption, Mr. Kamal? The contract process is a two-step process. First, the town signs an MOA. As soon as the memorandum of fund agreement is signed, the town begins paying. Paying, so, but we're going to be retroactive back to these dates? We've paid <coughs> the retro pay already. We paid the retro pay already. Yeah. So through the chair, it goes, it goes back to the expiration date of the, the last contract. But that already has been paid. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure the citizens understand that we've got it budgeted, number one. Yeah. And two, you're saying we've already paid that back, so we've kind of been paying a contract all along. Yes. I got you. Thank you. Great. Question? Questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous as well. Could I just uh, go back? one vote uh, was with the police dispatchers union. Mm -hmm. So the final contract that we've approved uh, terminates in June of 2016, correct? Yes. So am I to assume that we're starting negotiations with them now so that we don't have to backdate the next contract? Or assuming that both parties see eye to eye in that time? That clarification is key, yes. Uh, we begin the negotiations early, hoping we conclude them earlier, but as we've seen, negotiations take longer. Mm -hmm. So those have already started? Not yet. Not yet, okay. For the board's information, remember, we also talked about giving this unit enough time to experience the combined communication center and then uh, work out a contract agreement that reflects how that center operates. Okay. Any other questions on any of the contracts? Future board agenda items. Mr. Hart. I believe we have a running list, uh, some of which we haven't ticked off yet, correct? All right. I'm all set for now. Okay. Mr. Catino. I'm all set for right now. Mr. Moser. Um, the Harvey's contract, I'd be interested in revisiting that. Okay. And then also... As Mr. Herb pointed out, there's there's a running list. I feel like we're not seeing the running list. Okay. Mr. Sistari. Uh, I'd like for our uh, new IT director to come in uh, sometime in the next couple of meetings, actually, so that he can give his assessment of our uh, IT environment recommendations and so that we can be moving into budget season with our recommendations in the right place. Okay, good. 
Anything else? Okay. Uh, I'm going to take uh, take us back to agenda item two here, the public forum. I just I have a little thing I'm going to read here. Uh, it's a statement from me as chairman of the board. So I'm in my sixth year on the board of selectmen, and during my tenure, the accomplishments of this board include protected the town's financial state during the most significant economic crisis since the Great Depression without dramatic impacts on taxes, services, or personnel. Carefully controlled the growth of the town operating budget, providing all residents with continued outstanding service at reasonable cost, resulting in taxing residents cumulatively over $4 million less than possible under our Proposition 2.5 limit. We executed one of the very few budget underrides ever undertaken in the state of Massachusetts, guaranteeing for taxpayers that an additional $1.25 million in annual excess levy saved through our control of spending would not be reversed. We designed and implemented a funding process to begin to address the town's substantial long-term pension and other benefits liabilities and thereby prevent a future fiscal crisis. We gained approval of a new school. We gained approval of a new library. We gained approval of a new DPW facility. The board took control of marathon number distribution for the benefit of the town, resulting in over $400,000 in funds raised to date for local charitable organizations. We formed and led a multi-town collaboration group that was a key contributor to defeating a proposed Milford Casino. We advanced the revitalization of downtown, which is on its way to being the vibrant, engaging location we all hoped it would be. We purchased several important parcels in town to protect against further development and maintain the rural feel our residents value. We purchased the last two large parcels on Hayden Road to enable future town uses beyond the new school. This board advanced both the town trail network and the expansion of sidewalks identified by residents as key priorities. We developed a brand new town manager into one of the finest professionals in the Commonwealth. This board directed a search process for a new police chief and made the final selection on an individual who's proven to be an outstanding hire. We established a permanent building committee and created a capital asset management plan to ensure that town structures are constructed as efficiently as possible and that all town assets are properly cared for. This board continued to work with legacy and other large developers in town to accommodate their plans without destroying the town's character. And last but not least, this board oversaw a spectacularly successful 300th anniversary celebration, which as I touched upon, I know because I attended most of the events. So I'm sure there are other significant activities that I forgot simply because there have been so many. I have lived in this town for almost 20 years and I can recall no other board that has accomplished so much in so many areas and with so little fanfare or even positive acknowledgement. This group has been visionary, thoughtful and productive in advancing our town based upon the priorities set by our fellow residents. The work you see done at public meetings is the very small tip of a very large iceberg. We've done all of this relatively quietly, with great discretion and no self-promotion, and as a result, Hopkinton has come to take for granted excellence in local government. With all those achievements and more in 10 years of service to the town, and having spent almost half my life in some form of public service, I have decided to focus my time and energy on my family and other productive activities, and so I will not be running for re-election in May. I'm making this announcement now because I'd like to challenge a new generation in town to step forward and I want to leave plenty of time for those people to make their decision and have a chance to present their vision to the voters. I look forward to competitive election and to new members of our town leadership who will build upon this board's success and can continue to advance the evolution of Hopkinton in an equally positive and successful manner. With that, the Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Good night, everybody.